Good morning, Mount Olive. Welcome, welcome to worship today. Good to see all of you here today, and we pray that God would bless you as we gather to sing his praises and, and around his word and also at his table this morning. Also want to say welcome to those who are with us online today. Welcome to the house of the Lord as, as you gather in your home uh, to worship with us here at Mount Olive today. We're blessed to to be together, if you're a guest with us today, thank you for, for being here and being part of our church family this morning. A couple of announcements uh, to highlight before we, before we get started. Uh, we do have a few mums still left, if you would like a mum. There are some outside, or at least there were earlier this morning. Uh, a donation goes towards our youth group, if you'd like to take one of those beautiful flowers home with you. Also, next Sunday, we have our Fall Voters Assembly after the 1030 service. And so our Fall Voters Assembly, the main agenda item is to pass a budget for next year, for 2022. And so if we would invite you and encourage you to come and be part of the discussion and also the looking forward to what God is going to bless us with in the future here at Mount Olive as we gather as his people. Also coming up later this month, is Trunk or Treat. And we have a couple special guests here to, to highlight that for us this morning. <laughs> Good morning. We want to invite all of you to come to Trunk or Treat on the 30th. It starts at 5.30. And from like 5.30 to 6, we're going to have the kids going from trunk to trunk and getting candies and goodies and there will be a trunk decorating contest so and i hear there's some special ones coming um we also are going to have some games at six o'clock then we're going to move up to the shelter house weather permitting and have a bonfire and have a hot dog roast and marshmallows and mm -hmm. s'mores and apple cider warm apple cider in case it's cold and then we're going to have some games for the kids to play while we're doing the cooking and stuff to keep them occupied a little bit. So we would invite all of you to come. It's going to be a fun evening. We didn't get to do it last year, so we're looking forward to doing it again this year. Uh, is there anything else I've forgotten? Yeah, this is not just for the little kids. It's for the older kids, like you adults. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, there are going to be prizes for the best costume, whether it's uh, weird costumes, fun costumes, scary costumes, whatever. So adults, please dress up. Um, the prizes are nice, They're nice prizes. Mm -hmm. So please get your fun on, come with your kids, dress up, dress your trunk up and uh, collect candy. Because I know everybody loves candy, no matter how old you are. Um, please come, we're gonna have a good time. Let's get the fellowship back on again. What? Yeah, we're looking for volunteers. Yes, and we do still have a need for volunteers to help with the games, to help with, around the bonfire, um, just to help lead the kids around, whatever. We do, we do still need volunteers. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thanks for joining us today. Howdy. Howdy to you. Howdy to you. <laughs> All right. That's gonna be, I think it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. October 30th, 530. We'll start right at 530. And so um, look forward to that. Other announcements are in the bulletin. Also uh, sent out weekly via our email on Thursdays. If you're not getting those, please uh, leave your contact information at the podium on your way into the sanctuary. And we would be happy to add you to the list so you can stay connected in our, in our Thursday newsletters that we send out electronically. But welcome to worship. We're glad to be together. Let's stand as we call upon the name of the Lord our God. We call upon God's name as we begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 119. I seek you, Lord, with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches.
As we gather today to hear the Word of God and to receive its comfort and power, let us first come before the Lord and examine our lives in light of the commandments of God as we have learned them. Hebrews chapter 4 says that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. We first come before the Lord now in a time for silence and for prayer and reflection upon the Word of God. And together, with humble hearts, we pray. Heavenly Father, from your first commandment, telling us that we are to give you first place in our lives, to the last commandment, telling us to be content with what we have, we have sinned against all of them by thought, word, and deed. But we know from your holy word that you are a God of mercy and forgiveness. And so we ask for your forgiveness in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sin by his precious blood. God has told you and me in his living and active word, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Faithful to his word, your merciful Savior has heard your prayer of confession, and he forgives you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. God gives us his forgiveness so we can share peace with the world. And so we say the peace of the Lord be with you. You may be seated. I'd like to invite our children to come on forward for a few moments and join me for a children's message. Right, we got more coming. All right, welcome. Welcome. We have the young men's group up here this morning. All right. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, Pastor Jeff. All right, good to see all of you today. Good to see all of you today. I welcome you for a children's message and encourage you if you'd like to go to Children's Church here in just a, a few moments. But I want to talk about the number three. So can you Hold up three fingers on one of your hands. Can you hold up three fingers? Can you do that? One, two, th you did. You got it perfect, don't you? That's right. So if you hold up three fingers like this, yeah, there you go. If you hold three fingers, what letter in the English alphabet does that look like? It's the number three. It does. It does. It looks like W. It looks like, that's right. It looks like the letter W. And so the letter W reminds us of two important things, the word and worship, the word and worship. Well, God gives us the 10 commandments in the Bible, 10 important things that he wants us to follow in our daily lives. And the third commandment, can you hold the number three up again? The third commandment says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's right. And so God wants us to remember that we are called as his people to gather together for the word of God and to worship God. So did you notice that that's what we're here today to do? To worship God and to receive the word of God. You see, Jesus came to life after he had died and rose again. He came to life after he died upon the cross to take our sins away. And do you know what day of the week Jesus came back to life on? What day was it? He died on a Friday, and he came back to life on a, do you know? You know Easter Sunday, on a Sunday. And so that's why we worship together on Sundays, because Jesus came back to life again on a Sunday. And so Sundays become very important for us. Remember, the third commandment says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How do we remember? The word of God and to worship God. 
And so we ask that God would bless our worship and bless us as we receive his word this morning in the Bible. What do you say, boys and girls and everyone? We go ahead and fold our hands and bow our heads and let's close our eyes and focus upon Jesus. And we invite the whole church to pray. Please repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Heavenly Father, help me to obey your commands Help me to obey your commands, to love and trust in you, to love and trust in you, and do all your word says, and do all your word says. Help me to honor your word. Help me to honor your word. Help me to worship you. Help me to worship you as we gather together today, as we gather together today. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Pastor Bruce is over there. For those who are headed to Children's Church this morning, we welcome you. We've got a good young men's club here today, that's for sure. We like to hang out. All right, a word about our offerings. A word about our offerings. Thank you for those who continue to give offerings to support the ministry of our congregation. We do have a giving box that's just outside the sanctuary that you can uh, use to place any uh, gifts that you have brought this morning. We also have a Give Plus app. If you have been giving electronically, there's no need to change any apps at this time. We've had some confusion about that. We're staying with where we are for now, but hopefully in the new year, we will have a new and easy-to-use platform where we can give electronically as well. So more on that. So the simple word is, whatever's working for you now, please keep it up. And we thank, that, we thank God for blessing both the givers and the gifts that are received for the glory of his name. Let's turn our attention now to our, our scripture lesson from Hebrews chapter 4. Good morning. Our New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of the Lord.
Jesus' words to us in today's Gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, Jesus said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord. You may be seated as we join in singing our confession of faith.
in the name of Jesus, dear sisters and dear brothers in Christ. I was told many years ago, and maybe you've heard this before, that God the Father is indeed a fan of baseball. Have you heard this before? That God is a baseball fan. Because you know what it says, don't you? In the very first sentence of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so people said it's clear that God is a baseball fan. Well, what's not clear from Holy Scripture, and so what I can't faithfully espouse today, is who God roots for as a baseball fan. I cannot tell you that. I have my personal opinions. Brother Ken, you do too. Others of you have different opinions that you're entitled to. Um, Some would say, I would never publicly say this, some would say that, that God is a Cubs fan. Uh, because the Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so God's got a like inverted way of rooting for things. Uh, But I would never say that publicly, Tony. I would never claim that at all. Uh, But I also know that the Bible says that, yes, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so Genesis tells us how he spent time with his word creating all things out of nothing. So with his powerful word, he brought the world and the universe into being. But then after six days of work, God got to the seventh day. And in some ways, it was like a seventh inning stretch, if you will. It was a time for rest. And God Sabbathed. He stopped what he was doing on the seventh day And he made the seventh day special and holy as a day of Sabbath rest. Now, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, We're actually in confirmation class going to talk about it some tonight. And so some who are here today are getting a little preview of what we'll discuss in confirmation class tonight. But as I was preparing for confirmation and also looking at the reading from Hebrews chapter 4 that was scheduled for us for today, realize they're speaking of the same thing. The idea of us entering into God's Sabbath with him and seeing Sabbath as a gift of God. Hebrews chapter 4 says, there then remains a Sabbath rest. The word Sabbath means stop or rest, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so as we come under the authority of the word of God today, what does it mean to enter into the Sabbath rest with God? Jesus. Well, we start with the third commandment. The third commandment out of the ten that God gives to us in Exodus chapter 20, and then God repeats himself in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The third commandment simply says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And so God Sabbathed. And what does that mean for us? When 1529, and ever since for Lutheran Christians, We've been answering it this way with Luther's explanation of the third commandment. We should fear and love God. That is, we should put God first so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but but we would hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. As I shared with the kids in the children's message this morning, a way to remember the third commandment. As explained, it's not so much about a day as it is about the purpose of the Sabbath. That is a time for God's Word, a time to rest from work, and a time to worship the Lord our God. And so what is the Sabbath day? As We have some questions and answers here this morning. Well, in the Old Testament, God set aside the seventh day as a day required for rest and for worship. And so Saturday was the day in which God took his seventh inning stretch, if you will. And so for Old Testament believers, they followed the Sabbath religiously. 
They set up rules and regulations to guard and protect that particular day so that they actually would be restricted in how far they could travel from home, only far enough to get to a place to worship and get back. But they wouldn't go about their regular routines of life and of work. It was literally a day to stop. For the word Sabbath actually does mean stop. If you go to the Holy Land today, you will be able to recognize stop signs. They look like stop signs do in our country. And yet, without the English letters, they have the Hebrew letters that say Sabbath on them. That is to stop. And so to stop, to pause, to take time for rest, to recharge, and to be rejuvenated. To enter into the rest with God and and to give Him praise and worship and honor and glory for the works that He has done in our lives. And so then we fast forward from God establishing the Sabbath day to us as believers in Jesus who are living right now. And so does God require us to observe the Sabbath and other holy days of the Old Testament? So here's what the Catechism points out for us. That the Sabbath was a sign. So I think of that stop sign. And it's like a stop sign, but it's a sign that also has an arrow on it. And the Sabbath's arrow is pointing us to Jesus, who is our ultimate rest. As Matthew chapter 11 says, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so Jesus gives rest for our souls and knowing that our sin that that separates us from God has been atoned for, it's been paid for by His blood shed upon the cross. And so because Jesus has come as our Savior and our Lord, God no longer requires us to observe a particular Sabbath day or other holy days of the Old Testament for there were many and various holy days in Old Testament times. Colossians chapter 2 kind of sums it up. It says that those days, those regulations, those times, those feasts, those festivals are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ, the New Testament says. And the word for reality in the biblical Greek is soma, soma. Soma is a word that means flesh, it means body, it means substance. And so soma is contrasted with the shadow. A shadow is not flesh. A shadow is not body. A shadow is not substance. But soma is flesh, is substance, it's body, it's reality. And that reality, it says, for us as believers in the Lord our God is found in Jesus. And so the purpose of the Sabbath commandment is not about a particular day, but it's about a particular person. A person who invites you and me to love and trust in him to give him our lives to recognize that he gave his life to pay for our lives so in turn we give our lives to give him glory and so it's to enter in to rest with jesus christ to rest secure in his presence to know that he is our savior and our god that that he is with us that he has paid the price for our sins that he has guaranteed us life forever in the kingdom of of heaven And so if we have this rest who is Jesus, who is also now our substance, our flesh, our body, our being, then what does God require of us? Does God require the church to worship together on any specific days? Well, God does require Christians to worship together. He requires Christians to worship together, although he has not specified a particular day. But the idea that Christians can be a lone ranger or an isolated island is simply foreign to the Scriptures. There is no such thing as an isolated believer in Jesus. That if we are believers in Jesus, we will be part of a community. That we need the flesh, the substance, the body of Christ that is the church. We need one another. Christians are not intended to be sitting isolated and alone, but coming together as the people of God to worship Him and to be devoted to His Word. It started that way in the earliest church. In Acts chapter 2, 
right after Jesus had ascended into heaven and then sent his Holy Spirit that filled his earliest believers, it says that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that they devoted themselves. So they were committed to this. They were committed to this, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So four things. The teaching of the apostles, which we also have recorded in the New Testament that tell us of Jesus and his words and actions and deeds, to the fellowship that is the gathering together of people, to the breaking of bread that we will partake in today, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ shed for us, and to prayer of lifting our hearts before God. And so those four things are part of what we do right here and now. Those four things are part of what are the signs of the church wherever the church is found throughout the world, devoted to the teaching of God's Word, to fellowship, to breaking the bread of Holy Communion, to praying and lifting our hearts to the Lord. That is what God requires of His people to worship together. But why do we typically do it on a Sunday? Well, the church typically worships together on Sundays because of one simple fact— that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. And so Jesus in the flesh, in his soma, in his reality, who had died upon the cross, who was buried in the grave on a Sabbath, he rested. And yet on the first day of the week, he came back to life again. And so Christians realize that their life is found in Jesus. And so as a way to remember that, Christians typically gather on the day that Jesus came back to life again. And so Sundays become a mini Easter for us, if you will, a time to celebrate his presence in our lives and to realize that our life, our substance is found, our reality is found in Christ. And so already in the earliest church, the earliest believers in Jesus didn't do away with Sabbathing. They, they most likely continued with their customs. Those who came from a, a Jewish household would have continued with their Sabbath customs, but they added to it the importance of a Sunday for them. And so in Acts chapter 20, we have a, re, a recorded uh, example of what took place on a Sunday, on the first day of the week. So that's Sunday, right? We set the tone for the week on the first day of the week, that God gets the first he gets the best, and so therefore the rest belongs to him as well, but we give him our best. And so it says we came together to break bread, and Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking till midnight. So we have a pattern that is set here. They come together on a Sunday, they break bread, and preach long sermons, right? Did you notice that? And if you read further, I kid you not, do this Sometime, if you read further in Acts chapter 20, you'll meet a young man named Eutychus who was at this long church service with a long sermon. And he was sitting in the window of the house where they had gathered. And Eutychus, it says, fell asleep in the sermon. And he falls out of the window. I kid you not. And Eutychus falls out of the window and they believe that he has died. And so what Paul does is he goes downstairs and he hugs Eutychus and Eutychus comes back to life. And they all go inside, and they have a meal together, and Paul keeps preaching. He, he doesn't stop the sermon. He keeps it going. And so they are devoted to what they were doing together. And that happens when? That happens on a Sunday, acknowledging that Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. And so when the Catechism lays out the different commandments of God for us, it usually then does it in such a way that says, okay, how do we break this command in our lives? How are we aware of our sin and our need for God's forgiveness? And then how do we honor this command? How do we keep this command in our lives? And so first, how do we sin against the third commandment? Well, we sin against the third commandment when we despise preaching and the word of God by not attending public worship, by not using the word of God and the sacraments, or by using them negligently or 
carelessly. So remember, when God designed the Sabbath, it was for rest and for worship. And it seems in our culture today that we have done a good job of stopping work so that we can rest. But we've done a pretty poor job at stopping our rest and our work so we can worship. And God desires both, that we would take time to rest, but we would also take time to worship him, to prioritize our life, to receive the word of God, and to gather at his table. And so I would say to our confirmands, as I will say to them tonight, then am I guilty of breaking this commandment? And some kids will say, well, no, Pastor Jeff, you're forced to be at church. It's your job. You come to church, you don't break the third commandment. But I would say to them, but yes, I do. And I have, and I can still struggle with this because of that last part. Do you see what it says? Negligently or carelessly. That so sometimes your body might be physically in church, but your mind or your heart might drift elsewhere. Well, God wants us to be fully engaged in mind, heart, body, and all that we are to focus upon his word and to give it priority in our lives. As Jesus said, the one who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me. But the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The Psalm 119 at the beginning of service today said that greater than riches is the commands of God. The commandments of God are important to us. We want to honor God's commands in our life. And so how do we honor his third commandment? Well, we honor the third commandment as we hold preaching and the word of God as sacred. So to be sacred means to be set apart. And so we set apart this time, this physical space, this gathering of believers at Mount Olive as sacred to us. And so we want it to be sacred in our lives. That we say, God, we put you first, therefore we prioritize our lives around the word of God. We hold it sacred. Secondly, we should gladly hear it and learn it and meditate on it. The, the word for meditate in the Bible is not some kind of transcendental meditation term, but it actually is a term that has to do with digestion, and it means to chew over and over again. And so to chew upon the Word of God that even when we've heard it once, we receive it again. And that we learn from it and we receive its nutrients each and every time we digest it. That even that third commandment that we may have learned before, we need to be reminded again so that we gladly hear and learn and chew and meditate upon the words and the promises of God. And thirdly, that we honor and support the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. We honor it with our, our presence to hear and receive it. We honor it with our gifts to support the ministry of the church together. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 in the Old Testament said it this way, Do not let the book of the law, that is the Torah, depart from your mouth. God's Word, don't let it depart from your mouth. But meditate on it, chew on it. Receive its nutrition day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then the New Testament. And the same book that reminds us that the reality, the soma, the flesh, the substance is found in Christ. It says, let the word of Christ, this, this reality, dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude, with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. For God has called us to Sabbath, to take time away from work so that we would worship him and receive his word, so that we enter into the rest and we find that Jesus is our ultimate rest. May we receive him. And may we honor and support and continue to teach his word each and every day in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we now enter into the rest of God and enter into a time of prayer and preparing our hearts for the breaking of bread in Holy Communion. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this day in the name of Jesus, our Sabbath rest. 
that you have called us, O Lord, to put a stop sometimes to our work and to our labors so that we could rest, be rejuvenated, to reflect and to receive you as you come to us through your mighty word. We thank you, Father, that Jesus is our ultimate rest, that he has destroyed sin and death and the power of the devil for all those who trust in him. We thank you that by your life, death, and resurrection, Lord Jesus, that you have claimed us as your people and that we belong to you. In this life, we live by faith, and in the world to come, we will live by sight. We thank you, Lord, for this precious gift. We thank you, Lord, for all of the different blessings that you give to us in this world, for your blessing upon our individual lives and the blessing that you give to Christian families. Today we rejoice with those who rejoice, including David and Phyllis Shudders, as they will celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary this week, and for David Shudders as he celebrates his 85th birthday today. We thank you, Lord God, for your blessings in Dave and Phyllis's lives and the ways that you bless our congregation through them. Be with them and fill them, O Lord, with your love this day and always. Father, we pray for those families who are grieving the loss of life. And today we pray for Jennifer Sissel and her family as they mourn the passing of her uncle David. We ask you, O Lord, to comfort them with the sure and certain promises of Jesus who is the resurrection and the life and who has said that those who believe in him shall live even though they die. We pray, Father, for those who are going through difficult struggles with their physical health. We pray for Destiny Davis as she recovers from a successful surgery on her broken leg. We pray the same also for Catherine Pesh as she recovers from a broken leg. We pray for Nunzio Merlo, the father-in-law of Carl Losasso's sister, as he is hospitalized and recovering we pray, Lord, that you would continue to sustain and bless him. For Dave Robards, our neighbor here at Mount Olive, who recovers from a successful lung transplant surgery, that your hand of healing would continue to remain with Dave. We pray for those who are going through different treatments for cancer, including Fred, Anna, Angie, Chris, Dirk, Bob, Brian, Louise, Terry, Jennifer, Charles, Mark, Christy, Ken, Janet, Barb, Gordon, and others, O oh Lord, that we know and love and name before you now in our hearts. Healing God, reach down with your mercy into each heart and life that needs your care this day. Watch over our land and all who serve and bless us by protecting us. Bring an end, O oh Lord, to the COVID pandemic, that your cleansing power may be at work throughout the world. And today, Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive you, as your Son comes to us in his body and blood, grant us, O oh Lord, as we fellowship with you, to also recognize the importance of our fellowship with one another. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we know that the reality, the substance, the flesh, is found in Jesus and him alone. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and those for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now gather together in the name of our Savior Jesus at his command, and we remember his words, whereby he gives us this precious gift of Holy Communion. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner also, Jesus took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Jesus until the day he comes again. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated.
May this, the true body and blood of your Lord and your Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in the true faith till life everlasting be filled with joy and with his peace. Amen. Please stand as we go forward with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord and have a wonderful week. Sing it.